from our archives, the Billy Graham Classic. In Time Magazine earlier this year, there was an interview with George Lucas. He said, I think there is a God. I'm not sure. I don't know what he is, what he looks like. I'm not sure about him. That's maybe how you feel tonight. I want to tell you about him tonight. I want to tell you about God. The first book, the first verse in the Bible tells us, in the beginning, God. Now, where did God come from? How could he just suddenly appear? And in the beginning, there was God. I don't know. Neither do you. The Bible says that he's from everlasting to everlasting. How can that be? I don't know. There's a mystery to it all. And yet by faith we believe that God had no beginning and he has no end. I cannot even prove to you the existence of God. No scientist can. How do we know there's a God? You can't put him in a test tube. You can't make a mathematical formula of him as Einstein did in relativity. You accept by faith that he is the creator of the whole universe. When Charles Lindbergh took his plane, the Spirit of St. Louis, all the stars that he could see spread over the entire sky were just part of our Milky Way, just our little galaxy. But that galaxy is just one tiny part of a universe containing billions of galaxies. And they found now that there are galaxies beyond what they thought was the last one with billions and billions and billions of planets and stars and suns. And last January, astronomers saw a gamma ray burst that came from way beyond the galaxy. It originated nine billion light years away. How, how, how long would that be? Count it up, you mathematicians. One light year is five well, almost six trillion miles. Do you know what a trillion is? I don't. <laughs> but the Bible says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the psalmist said, when I consider the heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars, which thou hast ordained, the Bible says in Psalm 33, by the word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Think of it. And then the Bible teaches in this same passage, the third chapter of John, or the next chapter, I guess it's in the fourth chapter, that God is a spirit. God is a spirit. He doesn't have a body like you and me. He's not located in just one place. He's all over the world, all over the universe at the same time. He's not limited by a body. He is spirit. How do you explain that? I don't. But the Bible says something else about him. The Bible says, I am the Lord, I change not. He's unchanging. In all these centuries and trillions of years, he's never changed one iota. In him there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning, the Bible says. God does not change. The Bible also teaches that God is a holy God. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. The Bible says, Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity. 
God is absolute purity. I remember when I was a boy in North Carolina, we would all look forward to the day when maybe we'd have a little bit of snow. We didn't get much snow in the place I lived, but boy, when it came, we were excited. And I remember my mother pointed out something to us one day when the snow came. She put out some washing, some sheets and towels and shirts and things to hang out that when the sun came out, it would dry. And then she said, look at the snow. Don't you think it's clean and white? And look at the clothes, the clothes that she had wa washed that we thought were perfectly white were now dirty in comparison to that snow. And that's the way we are. In, the, in comparison to God, we're dirty. He is absolute holy. But the Bible also teaches that God is a God of judgment. The Bible says it is appointed unto men once to die, but after that is the judgment. There is going to be a time of judgment. And the Bible says that God will bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. The wages of sin, the Bible says, is death. You may confess your sin, but you must pay the consequences. When we abuse the environment, we pay a price. When we break God's moral and spiritual law, we pay a price. The Bible says that God has appointed a day in which he will judge the world. There's a day already set aside in God's calendar in which he's going to judge the whole world. But the Bible also says that God is a God of love. The Bible says God is love in 1 John 4, 8. In Jeremiah, it says, Yea, I have loved you with an everlasting love. A popular song a few years ago was, I can't live in a world without love. You don't have to because God loves you. Whatever your background, however many your sins might have been, how many mistakes you've made, whatever your ethnic background, whatever your educational background, God loves you. And it's an everlasting love, and it's a supernatural love. It's something that we don't understand. It's not eros, love, sexual love. It's not phileo, love, which is friendship love. It's something beyond. It's a supernatural, agape love that only God has, but he can give it to you if you come to his son, Jesus Christ. And that's what Jesus Christ was doing on that cross. He was loving you and taking all of your sins and all your failures on him at the cross. Now, have you ever thought why God created man? Many people are asking, who am I? What am I here for? Where did I come from? Why am I here? Where am I going? God gave man a choice. He created him, put him on this little planet, and he said, he put them in what is called the Garden of Eden, in a rock, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. God said, there's one tree. You can have all the fruit in the garden. You can eat anything you want to, but don't eat of that one tree. God was testing man because God gave to man a free will. He can make his own choice. He doesn't make you a robot. He pushes a button and you do what he says. He gives you the freedom of choice. 
and in the Garden of Eden. God told man from the very beginning. But what did man do? Man and woman. The man and the woman ate of the tree. They deliberately did it. They were deceived by the devil because there's another mystery at that point that goes all the way through the Bible and it comes into our world today. The mystery of iniquity, the mystery of sin, the mystery of the devil and demons. And the devil is very real. He works hard and he can deceive. He can come as an angel of light, the Bible says. He's very deceptive. He slips up on you. He comes in your thoughts. He comes in your mind. We know that something's wrong. We read our newspapers and watch the television and we know that something's wrong in our world. And this is what is back of the race problem. It's sin. Back of all that is sin. And sin is the breaking of the moral law of God, breaking of the Ten Commandments, breaking of the Sermon on the Mount, also poverty. And today we have a desperate situation, in my opinion. Much of the world is getting poorer and some of the world's getting richer at the same time. And one of these days there's going to be a clash, as there always is. Man has a terminal illness, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work, the Bible says in 2 Thessalonians 2, 7. How many of the Ten Commandments have you not kept? The Bible says all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. We want to have our way. Not God's way, but our way. And that's sin. And so our basic problems are not social. They're not educational. It's sin. The breaking of God's law, the wages of sin is death, the Bible says. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, sin alienates you from God. You're separated from God, your spirit. You see, you're a body, but inside your body is a spirit, a soul. And when you die, what happens? Have you been at the deathbed of someone and seen them slip out into eternity? You wonder what happened? Well, the real person left this body. This body is going to crumble and decay and go back to dust. But the real you is going to live on because the real you leaves the body. And if you know Christ as your Lord and Savior, you go straight into his presence and you spend eternity with him. Now, death, death has three dimensions. There's natural death. We're all going to die. When John Kennedy, Jr. and his wife, Carolyn, boarded that plane a few weeks ago that he was going to fly, they never dreamed that they would never see home again. Like other young men and women their age, they had great dreams in their lives, their careers, their marriage. Two of the most wonderful young people I have ever met. I doubt that they entertained a thought that they wouldn't live to see those dreams fulfilled. And then there's another death, not only natural death, but spiritual death. Your spirit that lives forever dies in the sense that it's alienated from God. And then the Bible talks about eternal death. 
Some of the words in the New Testament used by Christ to describe the penalty for sin is lost, perish, condemned, punishment, torment, hell. You say, do you believe that? Yes, I do. I believe the Bible teaches it. I believe whatever the Bible says is true. If Jesus said there was a hell, there's a hell. I don't like to think about it. I don't like to talk about it. I don't like to preach about it. But Jesus did. He talked more about hell than he did heaven. The Bible says that Jesus Christ took your sins on the cross. For he hath made him to be sin for us. Think of being sin. That's all Jesus was on the cross was just sin. Your sins, mine, all the bad things that we've ever done, the lies we've ever told, the lust we've ever had, all on him, on that cross. And his real suffering wasn't the physical suffering, as terrible as that was. It was the spiritual suffering. It was our sins. He had never known a sin. And all of a sudden, all of the sins of the world are on him. The Bible says the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. The Bible says who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. The Bible says Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust. He died for you because he loves you. And from the cross, God is saying, I love you, I love you, I love you. I'm giving my son for you. He's taking your place. And then three days later, something glorious happened. He rose from the dead. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. You're never going to die spiritually because Jesus rose from the dead and died on the cross. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved, the Bible says in Romans 10:9. And that can happen to you right here, tonight. What are you supposed to do in response? In order to know that your sins are forgiven, to know that you're going to heaven, to be absolutely sure that your heart is right with God, first, you must repent of your sins. Well, what do you mean by repent? The first sermon that Jesus ever preached was on repentance in, Acts, in Matthew 4. Someone said that repentance means sorry enough to quit. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out, said the apostle Peter. God commands all men everywhere to repent. He commands it in Acts 17. To repent means to turn around and go in the opposite direction. You say, but Billy, I've tried to quit some of the things I'm doing that I know are wrong, and I just can't. I'm hooked. But you can become unhooked by the power of the Spirit of God. The second thing, the second one thing is repentance. The second thing Repentance means to change your mind, to change your way, and to change your habit. And the second thing is to come by faith. Now, faith is not some blind, irrational leap in the dark. Faith is commitment. When my wife and I got married, we didn't have our fingers crossed. The minister didn't say, as long as love shall last. 
He said, till death do you part. The Bible says that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. We must commit. I thought a cartoon in the paper put it very well. Someone wrote to the pastor and said, Dear preacher, what does God forgive you mean? The pastor wrote back and said, All your files are deleted. And that's true. All of our files are deleted. And that's exactly what God does. You don't have to leave here tonight worrying about some things you've done that are wrong. It's all been taken care of at the cross. And you have received it by faith. Faith means commitment. When I stood up on this stage tonight, it's the first time I've ever been on this stage, I committed myself to it. I'd never been on here before. I did it by faith that the people that built it, built it to hold a man or several people. That's commitment. Have you committed your life to Christ that way? Are you sure if you died tonight that you're ready to meet God? If you have a doubt about it, you make sure tonight. I'm going to ask you to do something that maybe you're puzzled about, confused about, uncertain about, maybe you've heard about the way we ask people to receive Christ. I'm going to ask you to receive him into your heart tonight by faith and commit your life to him and ask him to come in and change your life and give you a peace and a joy you've never known. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat and come and stand here in front and after you've all stood here, I'm going to say a word to you and we'll have a prayer together. There'll be a counselor here to speak to you if you want to speak to someone. We'll give you some literature to help you in your Christian life. You may be Protestant, Catholic. You may be a leader in your church. You may be the pastor of a church. I don't know. You might have been a good person all your life, but somehow down inside you're not sure about your relationship with Christ and you want to settle it, you get up right now and come and stand here. If you're with friends or relatives, they'll wait on you. It'll only take a few moments, but it's a moment in eternity for you. You say, tonight, Lord, I say to you, I'm sorry I've sinned. I turn to you by faith and receive Jesus who died for me. I want to make sure of my relationship with God. As hundreds are responding to Mr. Graham's invitation to make a public commitment to Jesus Christ, you can make that same commitment right where you are. Just pick up the phone and call the number you see on your screen. Special friends are waiting to talk with you and pray with you about this most important decision. I want to say to you that have been watching by television, that you can make this commitment to Christ right now, where you are, no matter where you are. You may be watching in a hotel lobby, you may be in a hotel room, or you may be in a bar, you may be at home, but you can make this commitment and let Jesus in your heart. If you just prayed that prayer with my father or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. 
there'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, thank you for watching and thank you for your prayers. I know many people that have tried everything in life and they have not found satisfaction inward peace, joy, assurance, and security. And they're still searching. You'll never find peace and joy and happiness until you yield your life to Christ. You never will. You have a moment right now. 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 The Bible says, now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. People are searching for the answers. You must make the choice. It's urgent. Hey.